All right, well, we actually are going to get started now. So a warm welcome to all of our participants today. We're delighted to have you here. And we have a fun-filled program this morning with lots of diversity. So you're going to be hearing from medical doctors, from climate scientists, from molecular uh, biologists. So um, a wide variety of, of talks today and subjects. What we're going to do is ask you to hold on to your questions and write them onto uh, index cards that are going to be distributed to you. So Chisato is holding them up here, and we're going to pass those out. And then we will have a, a good session for questions also from our online visitors that we can field at the end of the morning session and at the end of the second morning session. So I'm Dr. Jane Burns. I'm the director of the Kawasaki Disease Research Center. This is the eighth year that we've done this for parents, and we hope that this is our way of giving back and saying thank you for your participation in our many research studies, because we can't do this without you. And shown here on the slide is our talented group of uh, co-workers at the Kawasaki Disease Research Center, and I'm going to give some general remarks about KD here in San Diego. As many of you are aware, we have a very diverse research program here that involves everything from molecular biology to treating patients, and you're going to hear something about that spectrum today. We've recently returned from the 12th International Kawasaki Disease Symposium that was held in Yokohama, Japan. There were over 500 participants from 32 different countries around the world, and it was a wonderful event to be able to share information with a diverse group of researchers. We learned some updates about Kawasaki disease activity in Japan. So this is a country with a falling birth rate, but an increasing rate of Kawasaki disease. So their attack rate, the number of children affected each year in the age group of five years, under five years, is 350 cases per 100,000 children less than five. They had over 16,000 new cases in 2015, and this basically translates into one out of every 60 boys and one out of every 75 girls getting this disease in Japan. So clearly much more common than here in our community. And this is the new epidemiology slide that was shared with us at the international meetings. And it starts back in the 1970s when they started doing these first nationwide surveys of Japan. And you can see these three major epidemics that they had in Japan, which was very uh, surprising and, and uh, concerning for the general population as well as for the pediatricians caring for these children. And then you see this after, after about 2000, 2000, there's been a steadily increasing baseline, but a couple of little blips on the curve, which we're hoping our climate scientists are going to be able to focus in on to see if we can understand what happened back here in 2009 and again in 2016, where there were roughly 1,000 fewer cases. So we, we look at clues like this as a way of trying to understand the dynamics of this disease. Clearly something is happening in terms of exposure in Japan. We know that there's an important genetic influence as to who gets Kawasaki disease, but genetics take eons to change. And so what we're seeing reflected here is not a change in the genetics of the population, but a change in their exposure. And so the main question that we're trying to address with a very multidisciplinary team is what is that exposure? So here's our situation here in San Diego. The curve looks very different. And you can see that while we had an increasing baseline starting back in 2004, pretty much we've leveled off now. And these are total numbers of patients at Rady Children's Hospital. And we'll see anywhere in a typical year between 80 to 100 new cases at Rady Children's Hospital. We had a slow year in 2017. We're very glad for the children. Uh, we think this has something to do, again, with the exposures that they had in our county. And again, we're going to be working on that. And Professor Bernie is going to talk a little bit about the research that we've done to try to understand what that exposure might be or how it operates. The average KD attack rate here 
in San Diego as compared to 350 per 100,000 in Japan is only 25 cases per 100,000 children less than five. But if you are of Asian descent, and our Filipino community is our largest Asian group here in San Diego, then your attack rate is double that of the non-Asian children. And again, this is host genetics. We're all breathing the same air, we're drinking the same water, but this is how host genetics operates to create susceptibility for this disease. And here you can see a breakdown of what our Asian population of Kawasaki disease patients looks like. And you can see that over a third of our Asian uh, children were of Filipino descent, Chinese, the next largest group, and then the breakdown of the other groups in this pie chart. We also know that other family members can be affected, and we hope that all of you are speaking to your family at big family gatherings whenever you get together with them, reminding them that the genetic susceptibility for Kawasaki disease has appeared in your family, and therefore there could be other affected members. And we're through our genetic study, this can be a very important tool for us. So we've collected over 50 families where another member had Kawasaki disease, and these little stick figure drawings here show you what that looks like sometimes these are cousins, sometimes they could be siblings, although when it's siblings, they were never affected at the same point in time. So usually it's one child gets Kawasaki disease and the second sibling, either a, son, either a, a um, boy or girl, was actually not alive at the time that the first child was affected. But then, of course, the parents recognize it because you all become Kawasaki disease experts after your first encounter with this disease. We recently had accepted for publication, and this will be posted online for you to be able to read soon. Um, we did a review of 788 KD patients cared for at Rady Children's Hospital over this period of time. And unfortunately, 24%, so almost a quarter of them, still develop the coronary artery aneurysms that are the major concern of this disease. And again, if your child was of Asian descent, they were 2.4 times more likely to develop aneurysms. So clearly there's a genetic component to who gets aneurysms in addition to the susceptibility issue. So our major goal is to prevent aneurysms. We want to stop the acute illness and the fever and the misery, but we really want to prevent the permanent damage to the heart. So should that be through earlier diagnosis? Dr. Tremolay is going to be talking about all of the efforts on her part to try to provide tools to assist in earlier diagnosis. But here's a chart from this patient group that I'm telling you about, these 194 children who developed aneurysms in our cohort. And there are a number of pieces of information on this chart. What you're looking at across this part of the chart are the illness day at diagnosis. So how many days after the onset of fever were the children diagnosed? So these are the children with aneurysms. And what you can see is that very early on in their illness, sometimes even on day two, we were able to recognize and treat Kawasaki disease and despite being absolutely on top of the situation, our crack team in the emergency room, our wonderful clinical team with Dr. Uh, Tremolay and Dr. Sheets, both of whom are here today. Uh, we jumped on these kids, we treated them just as we were supposed to, and they developed aneurysms anyway. And even if we caught them within the first 10 days after illness, they were still developing aneurysms. And these Black speckled groups here are our children under a year. So clearly our young babies are the most vulnerable. And we need to come up with a better solution for how we're going to treat these very young babies and these children at risk. Now the diagnostic test may help shift some of these people earlier, and it certainly may prevent the missed diagnosis in this group of people here. But we have a lot of work still to do. So if we want to prevent aneurysms, one of the things that we're studying, and Dr. Tremolay is our leading clinical trialist leading these studies, is to come up with better treatments. So intensification of initial therapy. Your children all received IVIG, and that 
works well for a lot of children, but we need to be able to target the group that are at higher risk. We need to be able to predict which patients are at greatest risk of aneurysms. And when we looked at our data, we realized that 75% of the children who went on to develop aneurysms actually had an abnormal first echocardiogram. So that's the group that we will be targeting with this intensification of therapy. So the current and planned clinical trials that are open for enrollment, and some of your children may have participated in these trials at Rady Children's Hospital, are the trials that involve intensification of initial therapy for patients who have an abnormal first echo. So Dr. Tremolet is leading a study on atorvastatin. This is a group of medications, the statins. Many millions of Americans take these every day for lowering cholesterol, but they have a great effect on actually being able to reduce inflammation and in other ways protect the coronary arteries. So that's one idea. Then there's anakinra, which is a way of blocking immune activation in these children, another trial that some of your children may have participated in. And our newest trial we call the COMBO trial, where we have two different drugs, atorvastatin and anakinra, that work in completely different ways, and we're combining them together to try to have the benefit of both mechanisms of action in our at-risk children. And Dr. Tremolet is involved in a process with uh, Boston Children's Hospital in actually planning a national trial. And in that trial, steroids are another possibility for intensification of therapy for these children. And then another uh, medication that your children may have also received, infliximab, which we currently use for all of our children who have an abnormal echo. And then we combine it with these other drugs. We also have a study of a Pixaban. This is for children who have coronary artery aneurysms that are so large that we worry about clot formation in them. When a clot forms in the coronary arteries, Dr. Gordon, our adult cardiologist, is going to be showing you some examples of that, and it's clearly something we want to prevent. And a Pixaban is a very safe medication used in many adults, and now we're learning about its use in children. So we have a study open um, for our babies uh, and young children comparing apixaban to the standards, which are Lovidox or Warfarin, which are other anticoagulants that are much more difficult for our patients. We also have open a trial to try to understand the best treatment for our children who, where the fever comes back after their initial treatment with IVIG. This is called the Kid Care Trial. Uh, Samantha Roberts is here, and she's our lead coordinator for this, which is running at 30 sites across the United States and funded by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And we're comparing here giving a second IVIG dose versus giving infliximab, one of the uh, treatments that we use to reduce inflammation. So as many of you know, we rely heavily on philanthropy for all of the work that we do. We have support from the NIH, from the FDA, for uh, some of the trials that we're doing, but we've been the beneficiary of a wonderful matching grant from the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation, and the yellow bar here is the money donated by parents since our last symposium. We've gotten all the way up to within $200,000 of our goal. So uh, just a reminder that um, we, we are open for accepting donations. And uh, Amy Weeks is our wonderful development officer uh, who can be reached at the email shown there if you uh, are interested in donating or learning more about how you can help us raise money uh, to continue the research that we're doing that we hope is going to make the world a better place for all our KD children. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Bernie, who is a climate scientist. So she's not an MD, she's a PhD. And she is part of this wonderful interdisciplinary team. And I will turn it over now to Professor Bernie. Um, well, good morning, everyone. And, uh, and good morning, everyone joining us online. Um, 
I just want to express my gratitude for, for allowing me to talk here today. As a parent, I understand that most of you are probably uh, here or tuning in uh, because you are rightfully really concerned about uh, care for your children and, and, and what's next and what we're learning on the, on the, uh, on the clinical and care side. Um, I, I have been asked to sort of step back for a second at the beginning of this morning and talk a little bit about how we're using environmental science techniques to think about uh, finding what the agent or agents are for Kawasaki disease. So um, in some ways it might be a detour from what you came here for, but I hope, I hope it's nevertheless of interest. Um, so the big idea here, um, again, is that folks in the clinic, and maybe you even experienced this yourself when you went to Rady Children's, um, felt a little bit, you know, after, after all this experience over the past few years, felt that there was more structure to Kawasaki disease than sort of had been previously uh, documented. And, and by that I mean a few things. So uh, Dr. Burns, Dr. Tremule, others would say that, you know, in addition to having kind of a high point and a low point in the year, it really felt like there would be days when it was just insane in the clinic and days when it was really calm, sort of a much finer scale uh, temporal variation in the incidence of cases. And so uh, they asked us to sort of say statistically, is that true? Um, the second thing was, it seemed sort of like cases were also clumping, you know, a, a number of kids from the same region coming in at the same time, or a number of kids with the same kind of presentation of Kawasaki disease coming in at the same time. So it was also a question, so, you know, we feel this way statistically, is it true? And, 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 uh, and, and, the other thing was sort of, you know, if, it's, if, it, if it is true that this is sort of hitting people in different spots of the county, um, you know, what is that? What could that be? What is changing the exposure? So all of these are kind of the types of questions that we deal with in environmental science and climate science all the time, right? Sort of the statistics of how and when things happen, and then figuring out if those are related to environmental conditions. So I want to share with you this morning a little bit about where this work is at. All right, so, uh, but before I do that, I need to say that the data that we're using are you. And I'm really grateful for that. As somebody who's a physical environmental scientist, we, uh, we don't often get to meet the people who've given us the information you know, that, that we're using. And so it's, it's really um, amazing to think about these um, uh, you know, 1,164 cases, which are your children, and, 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 and using the data about how and when your children got sick uh, to really try to figure out what causes this disease. So, so thank you for participating, and thank you for being such an active community um, that, that participates in science. Uh, so you, you are a unique data community in that, you know, this is, this is a rare thing in the United States where there's one clinic that's really seen everybody, and it's the same clinicians who've seen everyone, and there's been a really standard set of tests that have been run. Um, and we know not just when you came into the hospital, but through sort of investigative uh, clinical work, when you actually, when your, your children actually, you know, were, uh, were ill with fever the day of onset. And that turns out to be really, really critical, and it's data that don't exist anywhere else. So, so you are a really unique um, patient and, and, and patient science community. Um, so we'll start with what we know. Uh, you guys have already seen and heard this probably, but there's a real seasonality to the incidence of Kawasaki disease, uh, both um, in San Diego and elsewhere. It differs from location to location, but in, in San Diego it tends to go up in the early spring, right, and come down in the fall. That's why we have the symposium, I think, in September, <laughs> because it's an anticipated low point. Um, but we then took these data, the dates of onsets for all of, all of your children, and ask the question, okay, yeah, we know there's seasonality, but, but if there's seasonality, even, even accounting for that, do these bursts, are they real, or is the clinic staff just kind of uh, imagining busier days than others? And it turns out that this is actually a very real statistical thing. So here I'm showing you just a time series of, let's see if I can use a mouse, mouse with my left hand here, a time series of all the patients um, for every day over this period, sort of 2002 to 2017, um, and the black dots are the number of cases, so zeros aren't shown here. These would be days with one case, days with two cases, days with three cases. And we used a bunch of statistical tests to say, if we just took all these cases and randomly, excuse me, randomly distributed them over this time period, how many sort of clusters would we expect to see? And it turns out that we see way more than you would expect by random. So this, this clustering, this clumping of cases in short time periods is statistically very different than sort of what would happen by chance. 
And that's, that's really interesting from an environmental science perspective because then we can say, all right, something funny, something interesting might be happening on these, in these time windows when we're getting these bursts of cases. And if you think about this from an exposure perspective, we can look at the environment to try to figure out what's going on in the environment, and that might point us in different directions to, to figure out what to research in terms of what this agent or agent, what these agents are that, that children are being exposed to. All right, so uh, we use a definition of four or more cases in seven days as our working definition of a cluster of Kawasaki disease cases. Um, it's, a, it's pretty robust to, to different definitions, but this is the one that made the most sense from the clinical perspective. It really felt like on the scale of a week, things would be really intense in the clinic, many, many patients coming in, or on the scale of a week, kind of being calm and not having a lot of activity. So we've settled on this as our definition. I wanna say I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, but it also turns out that statistically, it is true that cases that are kind of close together in time are also close together in space and more so than you would expect at random if we think about the, the patient population here in San Diego County. So the clinical staff's um, perception that really it was getting bursts of cases, not just in time, but it was patients from kind of similar parts of the county, it is really statistically true. So we, we do have this, this structure to exposure um, that is statistically very significant in San Diego County. Now, what does that mean? That's what we're sort of trying to figure out on the climate side. So what we do, um, a lot of text up here, but I'll try to just explain it uh, briefly. What we do is take that really amazing data where we know the date of onset, when your children actually fell ill, not just when they uh, showed up in the clinic, right, but when they actually fell ill, and we can say what was going on on that day. So if your child fell ill on, say, March 5th, 2015, we would take that day and we would look at the weather conditions um, in that day, both locally and globally, looking at circulation patterns, uh, et cetera. And we would say, all right, how different was March 5th, 2015 from the average March 5th, kind of over the whole time period? Was it warmer, was it colder, was it raining more than usual, raining less than usual? Was there high pressure, low pressure, um, et cetera? And we would take all those days of onset um, and, and calculate these sort of conditions for each of them, right? How, how different from average were these? And then we can look at whether there's any commonality among these cases um, in the ambient environmental conditions. All right, so uh, one of the things, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, some, this is when I get to pretend to be the weatherman on the news. Uh, I'm gonna show you, <laughs> show you uh, what this looks like. So these are global pictures. You can see a map of the world up here. And I'm gonna show you one of these weather um, variables. And this is, um, this is sort of what we call um, a, in climate land a geopotential height anomaly. Uh, but really it's a pressure field. So is it sort of high pressure or low pressure kind of at a relevant height in the atmosphere? And um, from this key down here, uh, the greens and yellows mean nothing, light green and light yellow mean nothing interesting is really happening. All right, so that means the kind of average days. As you get up into red values, it means there's high pressure um, anomalously high pressure, so abnormally high pressure, sort of away from average, and blue would be low pressure. All right, so when we look at days without Kawasaki disease, the date of onset of those cases, and we sort of average those conditions, we see that days without Kawasaki disease are normal days, right? There's nothing interesting going on <laughs> in the circulation. There's like average circulation patterns around the globe on days with no Kawasaki disease in San Diego County. When we look at all of the KD case days, so 1,164 of your children, uh, and when they fell ill, there are, there's a little bit of pattern that begins to emerge, but what's really interesting is when we divide out those cases into two groups. The group that fell into clusters, these tight temporal bursts of Kawasaki disease, um, those are on the bottom, and the non-cluster cases are this third row. And what we really see is that there's a very interesting pattern that emerges for the clusters of Kawasaki disease. So there's this very high pressure system kind of off of Alaska and a very high pressure system in the county. All right, so what does that mean? What are these conditions? Well, let's look on the ground. This is now I'm showing you local county, you know, sort of southern counties of, of California here. 
And now I'm just showing you the temperature. So what does it mean to have sort of high pressure? Great, what does that mean? Well, what that corresponds to here locally is really high, higher than average temperatures in the county. All right, so again, days without Kawasaki disease are ordinary days in terms of the local weather. When you look at all of the cases put together, there's not really a strong pattern, but when you divide those out, again, there's sort of, a, some of these cases are occurring kind of on ordinary days, but these clusters that are happening, those are warmer than average days. Um, I'm showing you data from the main Kawasaki season, sort of between December and April here in San Diego County, but this, this holds with a little bit of variation um, in, in the other seasons and, and the whole year round. Um, and we can see this if we look over time as well. So you have already seen that middle column. That was what I just showed you, the date of onset. But if we look at sort of how this evolves over time, from about a week before to a week after, we see this sort of buildup of the high temperatures and then, um, and then uh, cooling back towards normal again. <clears throat> Same thing is true um, at, the, at the global level, the circulation level. We see this high pressure system for the clusters kind of building up and then dissipating back to kind of normal conditions uh, for the season. So what does this mean? We're not saying um, that temperature causes Kawasaki disease, right? Or that high pressure, you know, off of Alaska causes Kawasaki disease. But rather, we're saying, look, there's, there is a set of environmental conditions swinging back and forth, right, between different states that really is strongly associated with it. So, so what's happening on days where you do have these pressure conditions and you do have these higher temperatures? Well, now we can sort of think about what that means. Um, and this is kind of consistent with... Uh, a story of like less air circulation in the county, right? So as opposed to getting those nice strong onshore winds where you have kind of regular circulation, this is, these are like stiller, warmer days, right? And so we can think about what that means. It, it, it could mean that whatever the agent or agents are are kind of getting stuck here, right? That would be consistent with it. So that, that's what we're looking at right now as a kind of working hypothesis. <clears throat> so, we do say, from, from the statistics, we know that there, there appear to be two modes of exposure, right? One is kind of um, uh, this kind of latent flow, low-grade flow of cases, and then there's these intense bursts in time. Okay, so if, if, if you were gonna start with those data, right, you would say, okay, well, there's a bunch of different hypotheses we could pursue from here. One is that there's one agent that causes Kawasaki disease, and it's just sort of being concentrated in those moments in time, right? Uh, the second hypothesis could be, well, maybe there's two agents for Kawasaki disease. One is kind of the low-grade one, and one is uh, sort of appearing in these moments where there are bursts. Another hypothesis might be, well, maybe there are two or more agents to Kawasaki disease, and, and they could be operating entirely independently of these temporal clusters, right? So we're sort of now trying to work with the Kawasaki Disease Research Center um, microbiology and genetics uh, teams to try to understand uh, what, what makes most sense here. And what we think, briefly, and you'll hear a little bit more about this later, is that, that we, we think that number three is the most likely. We actually think that the evidence is not consistent with, you know, two totally different agents corresponding to these temporal bursts and regular sort of flow of Kawasaki disease. We actually think that there's, it looks more like there's maybe more than one agent and we also have this weather phenomenon concentrating stuff um, at different moments in time. The reason we think that is that the way that patients present in the clinic does seem to be temporally related. So younger kids tend to come in at the same time as other younger kids. Um, kids who have um, different clinical characteristics, I'm showing you two here on the right, tend to come in with kids who have similar levels you know, of different, uh, of different uh, lab tests, similar clinical characteristics. However, these are not perfectly associated with who's in a cluster temporally and who's not. So again, people coming in clusters that look um, clinically similar, but that's not the same as these temporal clusters. So it does seem that maybe what people are being exposed to um, is not perfectly associated with these temporal bursts. So right now, um, we're really interested in figuring out if this, this really does point towards more than one agent for Kawasaki disease. So what we've learned from thinking about this from an environmental science perspective, a climate science perspective, is that there really is this finer scale temporal structure to, to disease incidence. 
um, and that these cases really do cluster in a number of different dimensions. They cluster in time very strongly, they cluster in space, and they cluster in terms of clinical characteristics. Um, the implications of this are that we're going to really start looking at uh, subgroups of patients uh, in a whole new way uh, in the future and to try to link you to the environmental conditions of when you were exposed and, and hopefully figure out what causes this disease. Thanks. Oh. I'm sorry, I have to give one coda. We're looking at other places next too. We're going to look in Seattle and Vancouver area. We're going to look in Japan. And we're going to look in Korea. We have new collaborations springing up with great data. Apologies for forgetting that. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Professor Bernie. Always fun to hear about what um, is going on around us and maybe helping us find the cause of this disease. But until we have the cause, um, we need to figure out how to be better at diagnosing it. Um, I am Dr. Audrey Tremolay. I've had the pleasure of um, taking care of many of your families. I'm the Associate Director of the KD Research Center here, and I'm grateful to everyone that's been here in person, as well as everyone um, that is joining us online. So I'm going to touch upon um, some of the diagnostic test development that we currently have ongoing. I have to echo Professor Bernie's thank you to everybody um, that's been involved in our research. Uh, this kind of work is only possible because of the clinical laboratory data um, that we're able to gather from your children um, to really be able to try to find uh, the best diagnostic test for KD. So there's a phrase um, that um, Dr. Burns and I have heard in our travels that I heard as a young child from my mom, um, that the eye does not see, the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. And el que no sabe es como el que no ve. So if you don't know about something, you're never going to be able to pick it up. Um, many of you have had this experience with your own children where no matter how many times you're taking your kids to multiple providers, they're not thinking about Kawasaki disease. So one of the things that we're hoping to do with our diagnostic test development is to give our physicians, our clinicians, the tools necessary in order to not miss KD. So we all know exactly why Kawasaki disease is so important. And we all also know that early treatment actually reduces the risk of coronary artery abnormalities. So it's so key to diagnose those children early. Dr. Burns shared with you our data here locally. We gratefully do diagnose children very early here, but that may not really be the case in many other places. And even then, there are children, as you saw, that are presenting late. As you can see with that white arrow, this is exactly what we're trying to prevent, are the coronary artery aneurysm development. And we're also trying to catch kids before they get to this phase. Now, as you all know, not everybody peels. We'll hear a little bit about peeling and some of the work we're doing with that a little bit later. Um, but the diagnosis of KD in some children isn't caught until they present with the peeling of their fingers and their toes. We really want to catch KD before that time frame. So who here um, in this picture has Kawasaki disease? These are all children that Dr. Burns and I have been consulted and asked to see and to evaluate whether or not they could have KD. But of this group, only two of these children have KD. And really, our job is to find that needle in the haystack, and we're hoping these diagnostic tests help us do that. So to give you guys a little bit of perspective, um, I, uh, we show this slide typically a lot when we deal with companies that are saying, well, what's the market? You have such a small, rare disease. Why would we want to develop a diagnostic test for your disease? And the answer to that is that there are a large number of children that are coming into our local emergency rooms and urgent cares with fever. And that's really the group that we want to be able to evaluate for KD. So here in San Diego County, over 150,000 children are presenting to our emergency room and our urgent care annually. Of those, about 10% have unspecified fever. And it may not be that we're going to test all of those children, but that's where we're starting from. That's the group that we really want to be able to, to consider evaluating. And we want to find the child with Kawasaki disease within those group of febrile children. So one of the questions that we're always thinking about is, are we currently diagnosing only the tip of the iceberg? We really have no idea how many children are out there with Kawasaki disease. We know that we see about 5,000 cases per year. 
Is that all there is? Is there more? We're really not sure. And maybe until, you know, we really think that until we have better ways of diagnosing this illness, we're really not going to know if we're really only seeing the tip or if we're already seeing the whole iceberg. So I'm going to talk to you about different modalities. I gave this talk a couple of years ago. Gratefully, we do have some really fun and great updates and interesting updates. But I'm going to focus on um, some of the artificial intelligence work we've been doing, um, go back and discuss the cell phone app as well, um, some of the movements that we've had with the um, urine tests, and then also some tests looking at blood with biomarkers. And as I always share, I'm not biased. I just want one of these horses to win. I don't care which one does. It may be a combination ultimately. But what I really want is I want to be able to come up with something that can help our clinicians. And what that is, I will leave to the science to tell us. So let's start with natural language processing. So um, the world of um, artificial intelligence is rapidly moving. Um, here um, at all our major hospitals, we are now all on electronic medical records. As clinicians, we spend a lot of time putting in data into the um, medical record of our patients. And the question we've been posing is, can that information help us in the diagnosis of our patients? So the process is taking that medical information that's put into the medical record and doing what's called tagging of notes. And so as you can see here, here's a note of an example of a KD patient that's tagged by the computer as having fever, as having the rash, um, as having um, the red eyes, as having the changes of the lips. And what we've developed is an algorithm where if you have at least three signs of Kawasaki disease plus fever, we're hoping that this will be able to then flag the physician and say, did you think about Kawasaki disease? Could you think about maybe it's a situation that you need to get some blood work in? So I want to share with you where we're at in the development of this um, uh, artificial intelligence work that we're doing. We had the good fortune of partnering with our emergency room here at Rady Children's. Um, Mike Gardner, who's shown there, is one of our newer emergency room physicians. And he is taking on the task of now taking what we have with the NLP and seeing how it works within the system of the EMR at Rady Children's. So um, while it may seem easy um, to those of us not in the computer science world to, we'll just put the app and put it on the computer and have it spit out. I wish it were that easy. Um, but we have a wonderful team of the folks from bioinformatics here on campus, of the informatics people over at Rady Children's, and then with our efforts um, from the KD Research Center to see if we can pilot this within our own emergency room. And if it works, and if it's working well enough in that system, then we'll think about taking it um, to a larger scale along our, um, in our urgent cares, in our community, in our emergency rooms, and eventually um, globally beyond that. So that's an ongoing process, and we're very excited to see that actually moving now into um, the, the ED um, setting. So I want to move on to an algorithm that we've been developing um, as well in collaboration with Stanford. Um, and this has actually um, made some, some pretty important steps. So here you have um, a picture of the algorithm. It's taking in some pretty basic clinical data. So um, does your child have red lips? How old is your child? How many days of fever has that child had? And then some very basic laboratories um, that were able to run in, in basically any clinic or urgent care or emergency room. And those data are put in, and then what we're asking is for the computer to figure out whether or not there's a high likelihood or low likelihood of this child having Kawasaki disease. We're, of course, all carrying around our phones, spend a lot of time on our phones, and it's something that's actually at our fingertips um, globally around the world, even um, when maybe major computers aren't for clinicians. And so what we're hoping is that someday this will be available as actually a KD app. So how does this algorithm work? So basically what happens is that you put in those clinical data, you put in those laboratory data, and then the computer decides whether you're classified as KD, whether you're a group of indeterminate where the computer says, I can't really figure out whether you have KD or not, or whether you're classified as what we call a febrile control. So it's a febrile child that has something other than Kawasaki disease. So the algorithm did pretty well um, when we made it to be able to, to figure that out with just one kind of small you know, step that it had to go through. But then it, it didn't actually, it still had about, mm, there were about 30% of kids that it couldn't figure out. So then we asked the question, if we try to make the algorithm different 
for the number of clinical criteria of KD that you have, then does it perform better? And it turns out that, in fact, we did get a smaller group of indeterminate children that way. So the algorithm is now different depending on whether you have one, two, three, or four, or five signs of KD. And so what we moved on to then was developing um, or validating this test um, with a number of different centers. So we've been able to partner with four other um, major Kawasaki research centers around the country. We were able to gather their data about their patients and to run the algorithm. And what we were able to prove was that it ran just as well with our local data here as it has nationwide. So that was very encouraging. We're currently working on that manuscript. And the hope is that with that, we're now gonna be able to move forward um, and be able to see if we can use this a lot wider, um, if we can use it um, a little bit more across multiple emergency rooms, urgent cares, we're working towards that um, in, with, the, with the KD algorithm as well. So we'll, you'll stay tuned for that. And this explains um, exactly how the multi-site study did. These are with our five centers. You can see there that with the KD correctly classified over 90% of our Kawasaki patients, um, it couldn't classify about 7%, um, and it misclassified and called a, just a handful, um, around 1%, that they had something other than KD. Um, with the children that had fever and didn't have Kawasaki disease, it performed a little less well, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with calling some kids KD. This isn't actually going to say that you have to treat them with IVIG. It's just going to refer you to, to think about it a little bit more closely and maybe call somebody um, with a little bit more um, knowledge about Kawasaki disease. And so um, just to, I don't want to belabor the statistics here, but I think it's important to understand how this works. That, um, the way that we look at these diagnostics tests is we know the truth. We know who has KD, who hasn't. And then we also look at the test result. And again, what we really um, matters most to us is what we call the positive predictive value. So those are the kids that we know have KD that came up as a, as a positive test, and then the ones that don't have KD that came up as a positive test. And that positive predict predictive value was very high at 95%. And then also the negative predictive value. So the test is negative, that means that you do not have the disease, and that was also high at 93%. So these are very encouraging results that we're moving forward with. And I had the pleasure of actually being at the FDA just a couple of weeks ago because these kinds of things aren't just going to rapidly move into the emergency room. This is, if we're going to develop a diagnostic test, it's actually regulated by the FDA. Um, so what I did was I, I thought, well, you know, if we're going to send this to the FDA, then I may as well go try and meet the people that are going to be regulating um, our diagnostic test. And so I had the pleasure of giving a lecture, having a chance to have a couple of key meetings with people. It's going to be a long conversation, but um, hopefully we'll have all the regulatory things in place as we move forward to really be able to do the right studies that will allow the FDA to approve this to be a diagnostic test that will be um, really useful to our clinicians in the community. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and focus on a urine test that we've been working on. So um, a couple of years ago, we published a paper um, with our, the collaborators at Stanford University and with John Whiten. And what we found was that there was a novel little piece of a very common protein called serum amyloid A. Um, that we found was a little fragment of it. Now, serum amyloid A is elevated in a lot of inflammatory diseases, so that itself is not um, all that exciting and specific. But what was exciting was to find this fragment um, only in children with Kawasaki disease. And we tried to make an antibody against that, because if you can do that, then you have basically another way to diagnose KD. Um, but that didn't work. So then we had to think about what are other ways that we can pick up this um, fragment of serum amyloid A. So um, uh, Dr. Burns was able to, um, she was at a meeting, and you know how we are when it comes to Kawasaki disease, we start talking to everybody about KD. And within that meeting, even though it was about dealing with fungus, she found somebody who works with these um, little things called aptamers. And these are little pieces of fragments of DNA that you can create in the lab that will recognize a particular part of a protein. And so um, Dr. Maria De Rosa in Carleton University in Ottawa has been partnering us with us to develop this technology. And so what she's doing is um, taking the fragments of the serum amyloid A and putting it through multiple rounds of picking out 
particular pieces of DNA, these aptamers, that will bind, and we really hope that this will eventually turn into a urine test for KD, um, which would be great, because in many times in our kids, urine may be a little bit easier to get than, um, than blood. And that would be a great backup, um, a great additional test to be able to have for Kawasaki disease. What I'm gonna end with this is an update on our biomarker development. And I'm actually gonna focus on what's called RNA. So we just spoke about DNA and the proteins. We're gonna go to that middle person there um, to uh, what's called a transcript. Um, and this is what happens as DNA is being, transcript, uh, uh, being translated into a protein. It runs through RNA. And it turns out that we can pick up RNA from some of the blood work that we do. And here we have a paper, this is what got recently a lot of press that was in JAMA Pediatrics. And this was um, in collaboration with Mike Levine at Imperial College of London, developing a, um, a diagnosis for Kawasaki disease using minimal whole blood of um, gene expressions of this RNA. And what you see there is a KD patient on your left versus someone who does not have KD. And it turns out that there's a particular signature to Kawasaki disease. In red are the things that are up, in blue are the things that are down in Kawasaki disease. And so to be KD, you have to have that signature that's up there on that top row. Um, so this develops into, a, trans, translates into a risk score. And um, there's currently ongoing discussions on new technology, microchip technology. Um, the folks at um, Imperial College of London, Mike Levine's group, um, have just given a grant from the Rose Trees Trust Foundation to develop this very technology, um, and we hope that this will actually um, push forward what we're doing with Kawasaki disease um, diagnostic test development. So with that, I will end with a big thank you to all of our parents, to the um, parents that have been so involved in being part of our studies, to our collaborators, and certainly to all of our funding agencies. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lisa Marotz. Um, she is um, a collaborator of, our, of ours that's going to be discussing why do some KD patients peel. Okay, good morning. Um, my name is Lisa. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to speak with you guys. We're going to dive into some molecular biology on this part. Um, so the research question that we've been addressing recently is, looking at why only some children tend to have this um, peeling phenotype that um, was mentioned in the last couple talks. And we think that it might be uh, fungi involved in there. So as background, I'm a graduate student, so my lab is actually in the next building over right here on campus. And for my research, I study the human microbiome. So this includes all the microorganisms that live on the human body. And so it's mostly bacteria, but there's also a lot of uh, fungi in the form of yeast, and there's also archaea and viruses. And it's only been in the last 10 years or so that we've had the technology to really dive in and identify all the different organisms that live on the human body. And it turns out that there's actually just as many, if not more, microbial cells living on us as there are human cells. So trying to understand what these microbes are doing and how they might be associated with health and disease is a research focus of our lab. Um, and the reason that I'm here today talking about Kawasaki disease um, comes from a research um, that came out in about 2014 that uh, Dr. Jane Burns was a part of. And so what they found was that um, Looking in Japan, they have really well curated data about uh, when Kawasaki disease outbreaks occurred. So as Dr. Bernie was mentioning, there's these clusters of um, outbreaks. And by looking at uh, that epidemiological data, um, they were able to associate that with um, climate data. So looking at different tropospheric wind patterns over Japan. And they found that when the wind was blowing in a certain direction, um, from this area in northeastern China that was correlated with these outbreaks in Japan. And so what they did was they flew a plane about a mile above the surface of Japan. Um, this map here is showing it, this red line is where the plane flew. And they put a filter underneath it and collected um, particles in the air when the wind was blowing in this um, direction that was associated with the outbreaks. And they took the filter and extracted DNA from it and tried to see if there was microorganisms in there that were associated with um, this particular wind pattern. So they didn't see that there was any uh, bacterial DNA that was associated with it, but what they were surprised to find was that 
there was fungal um, DNA that was in the filters um, up in the wind patterns that were associated with the disease that were different than the fungal patterns that were found on the ground. So in particular, they found that there is these um, genus of fungi called candida. So there's all these candida species that were found in the air associated with this disease. So with this information, um, Dr. Burns uh, has been looking um, also like Audrey mentioned at different immunolog immunological responses of the children with uh, Kawasaki disease. And what they've been finding is that um, the antibodies in the children with this disease also tend to have a response to proteins that are found on um, different fungi. So this is ongoing research, but it's two different lines of evidence that fungi might be involved um, as one of the etiological agents of Kawasaki disease. So with these two lines of evidence in mind, um, Dr. Burns came up with a hypothesis that um, this phenotype of uh, fingertip peeling, which is only seen in some patients, that it might be um, attributed to uh, different fungi that live or, or that are present on the fingertip of these children. Um, so she came to our lab so that we can try to study that. So how can we figure out which fungi are present on the fingertips of these children? Um, traditionally, what people would do is streak out a sample um, and look for microorganisms that way, see what grows on a plate. But the problem with this method is that we only know how to grow an estimated 1% of the microbes that are found on Earth. So if we tried to use these uh, traditional microbiology techniques, we'd be missing a lot of the microorganisms that might be present. So um, what we do now is uh, use molecular biology techniques, so specifically next generation uh, DNA sequencing to try and figure out which microorganisms are present. And so the general way that this works is that you have um, a sample uh, that contains microorganisms, um, like this fungi here, for example, and you can ex first extract the DNA, so you have these um, uh, uh, the DNA of the entire microorganism, which is very complex, but we just want to look at a specific region to simplify this. So we want to find a piece of DNA that is conserved enough along all microorganisms that we can find it, but different enough so that we can tell them apart. And so the region of DNA that we um, focus on is uh, a piece of uh, the ribosomal machinery. And so this is the molecular machinery that translates RNA into protein. Um, and so all cellular life has ribosomes, so it's easy enough to find this gene in a sample, but um, it's different enough at the nucleotide sequence, so the ATCG sequences are different enough that we can um, use it as a molecular fingerprint to figure out um, which uh, species are present um, on the microbial tree of life. So the general experimental outline of the way we do this is that um, Dr. Burns would collect a, a swab from the fingertips of these children. So this is just like a sterile Q-tip, basically. And you run it lightly along the fingertip. And then um, the, on that Q-tip then is gonna be um, skin cells and also fungal cells, bacterial cells. So all those organisms are there. When we extract the DNA, there's going to be DNA from all that cellular life as well. And then, as I was mentioning, we can use um, primers or pieces of DNA to uh, find uh, region, the, the ribosomal region that we're interested in, and we can barcode these in a high-throughput manner and um, run them on a next-generation sequencer. So at the end, we start with a swab, and what we get out at the very end is millions of pieces of DNA. So we have the nucleotide sequence from each sample, and we can figure out what types of fungi were present. So um, before we started doing this, um, the first thing I did was uh, optimize our extraction techniques. And so this is because you can imagine, first of all, that if you're just lightly swabbing a fingertip, there's not gonna be a lot of sample you have. It's very low biomass. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were able to extract enough fungal DNA to do the sequencing. And then furthermore, um, fungi in particular among microorganisms are, have this really tough cell wall. So in addition to the cell membrane, like we have in our cells, they have this additional cell wall that has chitin and different beta-glucans. And so to be able to extract the DNA from them requires um, special lysis. And so it's very uh, fortunate that at the same time that Dr. Burns approached us with um, this hypothesis to test, I had also received a kit that was um, 
specifically designed to extract fungal DNA. And so um, I tested the ability of this kit to produce enough fungal DNA for sequencing. And so what I did was I just asked some healthy volunteers in my lab, some colleagues of mine, and I, I swabbed their fingertips just like Dr. Burns would do for the children. And I split the sample in half and either um, extracted it with our traditional DNA extraction methods or with this new fungal DNA extraction kit. And um, what you can see here is that the gray is the tr traditional kit and the white is the new fungal DNA extraction kit. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the amount of fungal DNA. And so in our positive control, which was a pure culture of fungi, we got way more DNA um, using the new kit. And then also in the healthy volunteers from their um, swabs, we are able to get anywhere from 10 to 100 fold more fungal DNA using this new kit. So with these results, we felt confident that we could use these patient samples that Dr. Burns collected to try and um, look at the uh, DNA sequencing. Um, so in the experimental design that we set up, um, Dr. Burns had seven uh, Kawasaki disease uh, patients that came into the lab. Four of them peeled and three of them did not. Um, and she performed the swabbing method on the left hand and the right hand. So we had two samples for each patient. Um, except for one patient that we were only able to get one swab. So we had a total of 13 samples um, that we did DNA extraction and then fungal sequencing. So um, this is a slide just showing the number of um, DNA sequences that we were able to get from each sample. So as you can see, we were able to get tens or hundreds of thousands of DNA sequences from each of those swabs. Um, and so to look at this data, um, this very complex data in a more simple way, what we usually do is plot it in a principal coordinates plot. So um, in this plot, each uh, dot refers to a single sample. And the closer together they are, the more similar they are and their overall um, uh, amount of uh, fungi they have, different types of fungi they have, and the farther apart they are, the more different they are. So in this plot, I have um, them color-coded by the individual, so by the uh, patient. And what you could see is that since we have the left and right hand, the colors are clustering together. And that makes sense because you would expect that the left and right hand of a single patient look more similar to each other than they do to other patients. So this was just a proof of principle that we are able to get um, a good amount of sequences and that the data makes sense in terms of um, uh, what the overall fun uh, fungi diversity looks like. And so then here now to look at the peeling, I'm taking this exact same plot, so exact same data, um, but now instead of coloring it by the participant, I'm coloring it by whether or not they peeled. So in red are the uh, four individuals that peeled and in blue are the three individuals that did not. And this is a really small sample size, so we can't um, say that this is statistically true yet, but you can see that there's this um, kind of separation between the individuals that peeled and those that didn't. So that just suggests that overall there might be a different uh, types of fungi um, across these two different patient cohorts. And you can see um, that the patients that did peel tend to be more spread out. Um, and so we looked at the fungal uh, diversity between these two patient cohorts. And you can see that the um, patients that peeled had higher microbial um, richness or diversity. So that means there was more different types of fungi on the patients that were peeling than the patients that didn't peel. Um, and so that was interesting, but we also wanted to know which types of fungi were there present. Um, and that's easier said than done, but using some um, new tools, we were able to identify a few different species that were differentially present in the peelers and non-peelers. And what was really interesting was that we saw that in the um, children that peeled, they had these candida species um, more prevalent on their uh, fingertips compared to the patients that did not peel. And so that matches the results um, from the paper I mentioned at the very beginning where they found a bunch of candida species in these tropospheric winds at the same time as these outbreaks. Um, so the conclusions are um, that this was just a pilot study and we wanted to make sure that we were able to perform these kind of analyses on this uh, sample type. And so we know now that um, with the collection methods that we have that we can get high quality data from it. Um, and now this adds another line of evidence that fungi might be involved in the etiology of Kawasaki disease. So we now have environmental data like Dr. Bernie was presenting. Um, we have immunological data and now we also have microbiome data that they might be involved. 
Um, there's, you know, limitations since this was just a pilot study. It was a very small sample size, so we need to enroll more patients to be able to confirm that this is true. Um, and we also need to do further testing to identify which candida species are there. So it's easier to tell that the candida genus is there, but it's more difficult to figure out specifically which type of organisms are, so we're doing follow-up on that. And in the future, what Dr. Burns has already done is collect samples from the same patient over time. So uh, once they've presented in the lab, or in the, in the hospital, and then after they've already gotten um, better, so we can compare within the same patient, um, look at the fungal diversity uh, throughout their disease and see uh, that way if it's more correlated. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you to Jane and Audrey and Chisato for inviting me here and to um, my lab, uh, specifically Rob and Carson, who are my mentors and helped me get this data. So thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all of our speakers for this morning. We started a little bit behind because of uh, signage issues and lost parents. Um, so what we're going to do now is we've passed out the um, index cards to everybody and uh, Chisato uh, is going to collect any questions that we have from our audience. And because we started a little bit late, um, we'll take the questions now and go to um, and go to, uh, I think, 10.30, and then have 15-minute break, and then start up again. So we're going to shorten our break a little bit. So if you have questions, please pass them to uh, uh, Chisato, and uh, Ari's going to go around and um, pick up the questions. We're going to be reading these. We're going to be selecting them and ask our speakers um, to come back up. Lisa, everyone come back up and we'll triage the uh, uh, questions and try to get them to the appropriate person to answer. Okay, I'll take the first one. We're just gonna each jump up to the microphone um, as we have questions to answer. There's a question about the relationship between eczema and Kawasaki disease. And there have been large studies in Taiwan and Japan looking at the incidence of eczema uh, in children with Kawasaki disease, and they do seem to be genetically linked. So uh, eczema is a genetic condition. Kawasaki disease has a genetic basis for susceptibility, and yes, the two of those are linked. So it's very, very common to see eczema in our KD patients. Um, we don't know that there's any difference in the treatment, um, but Dr. Winnis Tom in pediatric dermatology at Rady Children's Hospital is a national expert in eczema uh, and psoriasis and Kawasaki disease. Uh, so she's a member of our team and um, if there are children with really severe uh, eczema who aren't responding to usual therapies, uh, Dr. Tom uh, at Rady Children's Hospital is the person that you wanna see. Uh, and there's a um, question about uh, Kawasaki disease in African-American children. We have a very, very small African-American population here in San Diego. However, uh, nationally, we know that African-Americans are overrepresented, so the genetic susceptibility is higher among African-Americans than among Caucasians and Hispanics. And we actually have partnered with the group in Atlanta to collect DNA from families there so we can begin to learn more about the specific genetic susceptibility in African-Americans. There's a question about follow-up. Uh, clinical follow-up of patients. So those of you who are, are um, under care here at Rady Children's Hospital, we uh, are a little bit different than the national guidelines. The national guidelines from the American Heart Association say that after a one-year visit, children without aneurysms can be discharged from care. Children who have had aneurysms or even dilation of the coronary arteries at any point during their um, uh, initial disease should be followed, and uh, we would recommend, and Dr. Gordon will be talking about this, a CT calcium score uh, before your discharge from care to make sure there's no scarring. But 
Uh, we follow our children a little bit more closely. We invite our normal ECHO people back every five years to follow up with us uh, until the exit visit where we hope we give valuable information and genetic counseling uh, to our kids before we send them off to college or whatever the next step is. Um, so we're a little bit different than the American Heart Association recommendations. Um, there's a, another dermatologic question about psoriasis. And yes, your child is um, at uh, increased risk for a special kind of psoriasis that fortunately is not chronic, but it's uh, a fairly dramatic rash that happens shortly after they recover from their initial Kawasaki disease, but it seems to fade away and then uh, never return. So that's the good news about that. I'm going to yeah, move on. There was a question about holding off on vaccination. Um, so um, the recommendations are that if your child has received IVIG in the last 11 months, um, to hold off um, on any live viral vaccines. So that includes MMR and varicella are the most common. Um, that does not um, refer to, the, to other vaccines that are not live. And of course, we always, as Dr. Burns and I are pediatric infectious disease physicians. We do not want you to get the flu, so please everybody will get your flu shot. Um, there was a question about, um, lots of questions about peeling. So um, there was a question about the peeling of the skin happening after, like later on and over time. Um, I will say that we do have patients that for whatever reason, um, even years after having KD, some of those signs of KD will kind of come and go, including the peeling. Um, gratefully, that's not associated with any um, heart disease from KD. Um, so we're not quite sure why that happens. Maybe there's an injury there that's occurred that's going to um, have that happen every once in a while. But it's gratefully not associated with any of the heart disease. There are some questions that came up about long-term consequence, echo follow-ups, adult KD. I'm going to table those until the second half of our talk because we are going to have um, Dr. Gordon join us um, discussing um, what happens when your children grow up after having Kawasaki disease. So we'll, we'll let you ask those questions again if those questions haven't been answered. Um, there are also some questions about um, uh, association with other illnesses um, that may be associated with once you've had Kawasaki disease. Um, besides the uh, stuff that goes on on the skin that Dr. Burns has referred to, um, we don't think of anything else happening all that frequently in our patients with KD. Um, many of your children are growing up. I'm going to put in another plug in from one of our studies. If your child is 15 years or older, they are eligible for our young adult KD study, which is a survey that wants that is the goal is to answer that very question of are there any other diseases associated with KD. A question from a family who participated in our DNA study. Uh, thank you. Um, we're uh, only collecting DNA samples now from families with aneurysms. And these are not genetic testing results that we give back to families. So we are partnering with people in London, in Australia, uh, in the Netherlands, and we're pooling together all of our DNA samples. So we analyze all the moms, all the dads, all the children together. So it's thousands of samples and we do not generate individual results. So no, you won't get any results back personally unless we were to find, not that we were looking for it, but we stumbled across a gene that uh, is known to confer risk of a uh, certain disease. And then you would be personally contacted by me with the advice to go and get formal genetic testing. We're a research laboratory, not a certified genetic testing laboratory. So they're not actionable results. But in general, uh, you will not get any individual results back. So there's a question about Kawasaki disease in Mexico. There's a lot of Kawasaki disease in Mexico. And next year, we'll have a lot more data from our Latin American network. Um, and I have a privilege of working with many collaborators across all 20 Latin American countries. We have a lot of data that we've collected over the last few years. And I'm hoping to be able to present all of that next year. But we have a number of manuscripts. So um, there are multiple cases that happen in KD, the group in um, in, uh, in Mexico City is very actively publishing a lot of that data, as are many other groups around Mexico. But there's KD all over the world, including all of Latin America. 
Um, there was a question about specific data from 2003. Please come, or please come find us if you're looking for specific data about when your child had KD, about epidemiological data. Um, there is no link that we know of between KD and valley fever. That was another question as well. Okay, there's a question about um, the fingertip swabbing and the time frame of that. So, um, so far we just had one time point, but um, as I mentioned, Dr. Burns has been collecting samples um, right when they come in and then after they're already better to ask this question specifically to see if we can see differences over time. But right now we don't know. Question about leg pains after KD. You know, I think all of you as parents are sensitized to any kind of symptom that happens in your child and always wondering, could this be related to the Kawasaki disease? And the answer almost uniformly is going to be no. Um, the leg pains that we see that are associated with Kawasaki disease, and Dr. Uh, Robert Sheets, a pediatric rheumatologist, is a member of our KD team. We do sometimes see arthritis or inflammation of the joints, but that happens during the or shortly after the time of the fever and the acute illness. So there are not long, long-term uh, effects on the joints. That's something that happens very acutely. Um, we get help from Dr. Sheets if it's very uh, severe. Um, often it can be cleared up with naproxen um, if the child has uh, those pains associated with the acute disease. And sometimes it is severe and sometimes they have to be, re be rehospitalized for treatment for that. Um, but there are no long-term associations with any kind of leg pains or arthritis. Um, and another question about a heart murmur. A heart murmur is, is a difficult thing to uh, explain to parents because it sounds like something that's bad. But actually, if you listen to the water rattling in the pipes in your house when you turn on the water, um, that's sometimes what we can hear in the very thin chest wall in our children. So a heart murmur is just means of vibration. And trust me, your <laughs> children have all had their hearts looked at by an echocardiogram, a sound wave study that looks at every possible chamber, valve, uh, leakage, issue, problem that could possibly be there. And if we've told you that the heart is normal, the heart is normal. So if in the future you're told that your child has a heart murmur, it just means that there's uh, water rattling in the pipes. You know, so blood rattling in the blood vessels or through the chambers, and it's benign. It doesn't mean anything. It has no significance. So if your child's had an echocardiogram, you can be assured that your, the heart is normal and none of these heart murmurs are anything to worry about. So there was a question about um, the, a first echo being normal in a child and what's the likelihood of, of that child going on to have aneurysms later in life. So it's really those first few weeks that are most critical, but as Dr. Burns showed in her slide, that many children do have, if they're gonna have any coronary artery damage, it's gonna show up on that initial echo. Um, the recommendations from the American Heart Association are of course that, you, that your child has an echo um, in the hospital and at least another one within two weeks. Um, and um, honestly, the damage of any aneurysms is gonna show up within those first couple of weeks of illness most likely. Um, the, there is a recommendation to see children um, a year later. And then as you know, our center does things a little bit differently than the recommendations by the American Heart Association, but we do continue to see children until they're ready to head off for college. Um, but that first echo, those first couple of echoes are really the most critical time period for anything to be picked up. I have a question here uh, asking if there are other geographic areas of the world that show similar uh, wind or temperature or climate relationships with KD incidents. Um, we are uh, trying to explore that right now. We've been on a little bit of a PR tour, I would say, in the past couple of months, trying to work with um, uh, groups around the world to, to get um, onset, date of onset data, so we can replicate this analysis elsewhere. So not just when people showed up in the hospital, but then following up and figuring out when they actually got sick so we can, we can replicate this. So uh, we are gonna do this in Japan, in Korea, and I think uh, Seattle, Vancouver area is our next stops, and of course, continuing it here. There's a question about incomplete Kawasaki disease, and the American Heart Association has 
um, an algorithm or criteria for defining real Kawasaki disease, but not with all of the typical clinical signs that we can see. And uh, it's about 20% uh, of the children that we see who don't have every one of those signs, but in whom they have laboratory criteria suggesting inflammation, and they meet the American Heart Association definition. I think we might have a slightly smaller number of the quote unquote incomplete cases just because Dr. Sheets, Dr. Tremolay, and I are the only three doctors who take care of these patients. We're very skilled in the physical examination of these patients, and we might see things, some of the subtler forms of the KD signs that other physicians might miss. So the San Diego data maybe is a little bit different than other places that might have a higher rate of what is called incomplete KD. And that simply refers to children where um, they can't document or see all of the physical findings, but they still have the risk for the heart damage, which we care about. I think we should stop at this point. Um, there are refreshments outside. I hope you guys will take the opportunity to talk to each other and meet each other. And then we're going to reconvene here at quarter of, so we stay on the schedule for our online visitors who are participating as well. And we'd like to get a group photo of everybody. So if we can just start with having everybody go right outside and get a picture. Are we ready for that, Chisato? Great. We'll do that before we all end up with cups of coffee on ourselves. All right. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you back at 1045.